voted the best television station on the Western Edge. Consolidated Channel 18. Opportunities in agriculture that we put on here in the Ag Department at Dickinson State. We use this as an opportunity. Um, the backbone of the program is to give our graduating seniors or those that are mostly graduating an opportunity to present their senior projects in a public uh, venue. We also have, for those that aren't online, we have posters scattered across the uh, the sides of the room where they have sort of visually displayed their the results of their projects. And they'll be writing a paper feverishly here in the next couple of weeks so that they can wrap up this. Finishing, finishing writing their paper. Yes, thank you, Toby. Uh, we also have displayed, uh, we have some smaller posters scattered around the room that our uh, World Food Crops class has put together describing various crops that are used for um, food consumption across the world. Most of them are related to North Dakota, but certainly not, not all of them, and we have some fairly unique ones scattered around the room. Although to start off the day, um, we have a keynote speaker that I have the pleasure of introducing to you. Kevin Thompson from Bowman, North Dakota, has graciously accepted our offer to come and visit with our students about opportunities as he sees them in agriculture today. Kevin is a uh, alumni from Dickinson State. I can add, I, I can age him a little bit by knowing when he graduated from Dickinson State and relative to myself. We're sorry to say roughly the same age, Kevin. Uh, and then he stayed here. He worked in our uh, uh, Office of Student Enrollment, I believe it was called at the time and then was director of the Dickinson State University Foundation for a, a long period of time before he left here, went back to Bowman and now farm and ranches in Bowman. He may, uh, on the, the family operation, or family homestead, he may be involved in other things, and if so, hopefully he will bring that up because that's all I could pull out of LinkedIn, Kevin. So if you have other things out there, let us know. But with that, help me welcome Kevin to the podium. <laughs> Good afternoon, and I'm glad that I could be with you and uh, to discuss a little bit of my view of opportunities in agriculture. And so at first, though, I'd like to congratulate the seniors that are completing your studies and uh, here at Dickinson State and wish you the best with your final project and in your career ahead, and that's Nathan, Molly, Skyler, Taylor, Adele, and Matt. I wish you the very best and uh, look forward to hearing about your projects that you'll be talking about here in a short while and uh, wish you the best of luck in the future. And I hope it involves agriculture as you continue down your path. I'm a very strong believer in history and I had a close friend of mine that told me it's um, history repeats itself every 50 years. And so you always need to look back at history in order to know where you're going. And so that's kind of the premise of my talk uh, today is to look at history and my family history to be very specific. I brought a photo with me. It's on the easel over on to my left. And this is my great grandparents that homesteaded our farm. I'm the fourth generation on our farm that's about 70 miles away from here. And so this was um, Otto and Emma Shoddy are the, uh, the elders in the picture and then my grandpa's the oldest boy in the picture and then his siblings. And so um, Otto and Emma came to this country in 1905, which doesn't seem like all that long ago when you look at um, the world of history, but for this region, um, it's about the time most, all of this area was um, being homesteaded by families. It's one of the last areas to be homesteaded from the Homestead Act of 1862, and Abraham Lincoln was the President of the United States at that time. And it's very interesting if you look back at that history, you were able to um, get 160 acres from the U.S. government if you were the presiding uh, head of residence, and it did not matter if you're male or female. Your skin color did not matter, just as long as you're the head resident of your home. And so you could come and do that. And so my grandfather, or great-grandfather, Otto, came in 1905 
to our farm that's about 70 miles to the southwest of here. And he moved onto the farm in 1906. Well, the important thing to keep in mind is the railroad in Bowman, North Dakota did not come through until the fall of 1907. And so my great grandfather made two trips a year back up here to Dickinson and retrieved the area's mail as well as their food items that they needed to survive to get to fall or to spring. And so can you imagine in today's world only getting mail twice a year and only getting your food twice a year? And so it's just one of those things that um, I've always wondered, would like to visit with him of that experience of going from Dickinson back to our farm and vice versa and um, do those type of things. I also find it interesting um, that he served in the North Dakota State Legislature uh, later in his life and, <clears throat> you know, none of us really know any of the history of that other than he served in the State Legislature and that he had a great um, opportunity to do that. And the other unique fact, he retired at 50 years old. He moved from our farm, moved to town, and lived in a very historic home in Bowman. Didn't come to the farm very much is what I was told, as he liked to fish and he liked to hunt. And those, those were his opportunities, and that's what he did. And so he transitioned to my uh, grandfather, El Elmer, who's the, the tallest young child in the photo. And uh, my grandparents, Elmer and Marcella Shoddy, lived on our farm, and they were strong believers in conservation. Um, they did more conservation on our farm than I can see on any farm in our whole uh, neighborhood. And so they did uh, terraces, they planted trees, they leveled a hilltop and planted trees, um, they, they dug furrows in order to catch water, they just did a mountain of work for conservation. And it's one of those things that we still do today on our farm, is try to do as much conservation work as humanly possible. The other thing that I find interesting, and this goes back into the 30s and 40s, they purchased the first non-contiguous land um, for our farm. And so it was about five miles away, but back then you didn't have horse trailers, you didn't have moving equipment and all those type of things. And so it was always an interesting feature. And unfortunately, I never got to know my grandpa. He died three months after I was born. And so it's just one of those things, I never had a conversation with him. But it's interesting when you look back and visit with my grandmother of how things all worked. But in 1959, my, great, my grandpa Elmer uh, wrote a letter to my parents who were newly married and living in Oregon at the time, going to college. And he invited my parents, Roger and Cordella Thompson, to come back and be a part of our farm operation. And it was, he had this long-term plan of how all this was gonna transition and those type of things. So my parents moved back to our farm um, in the summer of 1959, or let's see, no, it had been the summer of 1960, and um, became a part of the farm. And they got to enjoy about four years together, and then my grandpa was killed in a farm accident. And so they had all these plans of how they were going to transition the farm and work the farm and grow the farm. And then my grandpa was killed, and then everything changed. And my dad was 25 years old at the time and here's the farm. And so then this is how you have to, to do that. The other thing with my dad, transitioning to my dad, the third generation of this farm, my dad was a first generation American. His father came from Norway and immigrated and became a part of the Homestead Act in South Dakota. And so um, dad didn't have a lot of, you know, uh, opportunities with his father and especially when the transition went with our farm because his father was already dead and so there was not a fa father figure for my dad to go back to and so um, that really changed and it forced the this whole transition with our farm and ranch operation but mom and dad further expanded the farm they expanded conservation practices 
Um, the one thing, my mom was a school teacher. She's a, a graduate of Dickinson State and taught school for about 40 years in the Bowman system. But the one important thing for my parents was for my mom to have that second income and to have health insurance. And that saved our farm many times um, because my dad had a lot of health issues later on in life. And so it's just one of those transitions that you have, have to do. And I'm very proud to say my, my dad um, was, a, was able to be a part of our farm until he died. He literally, two days before he died, he fell in our house and we carried him out of our house. And my mom spent, um, she was born and raised on her farm. And uh, the one unique thing with mom is she always claimed she was the second oldest thing on our farm since she was born and raised there. And the oldest thing on our farm are the historic trees that my great grandpa went and dug up in the Badlands, the cedar trees. And we have about 20 of those cedar trees that are still um, in existence on our farm. And so it's very important. Um, we have built structures around these trees um, because you are never to chop one of these trees down. And so the only way they come down is if Mother, ta Mother Nature takes them down, and that's the way it is. So I'm the fourth generation, and I guess when you look at research and those type of things, I'm a living specimen of the average age farmer in America. I'm 58 years old. And so if you want to look at it from that standpoint, I think you need to, um, if you're looking at opportunities and what's coming up in agriculture, you need to figure out most of us are either bald, gray-haired, um, short, squatty, those type of things, and need some help. And so it's just one of those areas there's lots of opportunity uh, from a living um, person <clears throat> that's in this every, each and every day. The one thing, all four generations of our family have been very uh, strong believers in the following, a very strong education system. And so um, even though my dad was a first generation American, he um, attended college. Both of my grandmothers attended college. My mother and all my, my brothers and I all attended uh, and graduated with uh, college degrees. And, and so we have been strong believers in public education and can continue to do so. We also believed in the advancement of our farms through technology, utilizing the, the latest technology that you can have in, in those areas. We also believe in a, the importance of our neighborhood, that we have to support our neighbors and our neighbors are expected to reciprocate back to us. And so I encourage you to do those things as well. Also to become involved in your, uh, your community, um, different clubs and organizations or boards. The one probably critical thing, and sometimes Kevin has a hard time doing this, is be it adaptive to change. You may have your day planned out 100%. This is what the day is going to be. And you'll wake up and something has gone amiss and you'll be doing the total opposite. And so I just encourage you to be adaptive to change um, because everything is going to be very flexible and so you do have your plan of attack but um, for your day for your year for your years ahead but there's always something that can come up and uh, create a that you better change or adapt to and we also believed in hard work and so it's just one of those factors um, i get a lot of hunters and they always want to take me hunting and i've said I don't even own a gun to hunt. I own a gun to shoot a cow. But other than that, that's my opportunity of hunting. And you know, I, I'm glad people enjoy hunting, but it's just one of those opportunities that um, I don't really care for. So what does all this history have to do with you? You may be asking. When you look back at the history of agriculture, there was much more than cows and plows. And we're moving beyond cows and plows in a quick uh, fashion, and technology is a big help of that. The other thing we have to keep in, in mind is the agriculture community is less than 2% of the population of the United States. We have very little control, very little power as a group. And so it's very important that we look at working together, because when you take one point 
eight percent of the entire population um, to try to change something in New York City is going to take a very hard act of God in order to make it all work. And so I encourage you to do that. So these are some things that I would encourage you. Some of you are looking at going back into production agriculture, and I applaud you for doing so. But the number one thing that I would encourage you to do is something that I've already talked about, is to use, understand, and constantly implement technology into your operation. At all levels, it's very, very important. Um, my calf book is my cell phone. My, uh, you know, and so I use a computer program called Cattle Max, and I can look up any cow on our ranch as long as I have cell coverage. I can tell you anything and everything about that cow if if you want. Um, I had a, a banker visit this summer, and they brought along a new banker along, and he said, "What's the average age of your herd?" And I said, "Just give me a mo moment," and I pulled it up, and it's 5.1 years old. Is my cow herd? And the one banker said to the other, how many of your operations can tell you this? They said, you're looking at the only one that I, that I have as a customer. And so it's important that you do that. I also utilize QuickBooks so you can look at where you're at uh, from a financial standpoint each and every year. Um, you have to try to figure out the use of um, the smart technology sprayer, the high-tech drills and planters and all the other farm equipment that is out there. Um, I cut a lot of hay. I have GPS in my swather, and guess who drives the swather? I do. I don't drive the rake tractor or any of those type of things, because once I get the field opened up, then I set my lines, and then I just hit the button and we go back and forth, and so I can do some other things and think about other things instead of uh, trying to steer all the time, all day long. <clears throat> As Toby knows, um, we utilize a lot of cameras on our farm. Um, I am a true believer in cameras and in the barns and around the corrals. I'm also a believer in cameras on our water tanks and other things so we're not running back and forth in order to try to figure it out. Also, with the cameras in the barn when we're calving, it's very important um, from my standpoint that the cows calve naturally instead of being interrupted continuously wondering if they've calved, if they're having problems, you can watch the camera. And I have more eyes on my cows now than they've ever had in their life. And so I have family members that have access. And you love the phone calls at 2 o'clock in the morning. I think you need to go to the barn because this cow's having some problems. So you appreciate the call, but it's also like maybe you should come up here and help us out a little bit. So it's just one of those areas. Um, also the use of ear tags. I um, raise certified Piedmontese cattle, and so my cattle are directly shipped to Lone Creek Cattle Company, and all of every calf has its own EID tag. And I just went through certification on Monday morning in order to have non-GMO, grass-fed, certified, um, source and age verified. It's a list of about seven items that my calves will now hit on the little grid. And so it's, it's very important. And what I've also learned on Monday with this whole system is that they will track that calf all the way to your dinner plate. So if there's ever a hiccup along the line, it, they can track it all the way back to my operation or whoever's operation. You hope there's not problems. Hopefully you get to hear the success stories, but usually you always hear about the, the negative side of it. And so it's really important that um, record keeping and those type of things with the ear tags are, are there. And then this coming spring, we're going to implement a collar system. It's called Corral Technology. And we're gonna do away with our electric fences on our operation. And so this cow, you know, the collars will go around the cow's neck and will set parameters of this is the pasture that they need to be in. And, and if they get within 10 feet of the border, she'll get a noise on the right side because the fence is over here on the right. If she goes a couple more feet, she gets a little shock and a, a louder horn. And as she gets closer and closer to the, that border, 
the louder the noise will be and the intensification of this, this um, shock. And currently, all of this was being operated either mostly through a tower in your pasture or um, cell phones. Starting this spring, it's satellite. And so it can operate anywhere in the world. And so you can have cows in the, the mountains and you can crawl them. And they, they tell me, this is being developed in Nebraska, that you can move your herd of cows down within a 100-foot boundary around fields and the whole thing. And they'll, once they are properly trained, they'll wander their way through. And so I, I'm really excited. I'll be one of the first in North Dakota to try this on about 50 head. And it's um, a very unique experience that I'm uh, able to do. Um, and then you need to, uh, with technology, look at the latest um, corrals and equipment that you can utilize. And that goes not only for the cattle end of it, but also for the farm equipment. And you also have to keep in mind what works with your budget. Because I, I see Ernie over here, and he's, you know, uh, just looking at you know different opportunities within that as well and enhance your computer skills as much as you possibly can the number two thing is if you're going back into production agriculture is to either work with your family or to try to find a uh, a not farmer ranch operation that you can work with. And so maybe that first opportunity is a, a ranch hand or a farm hand in order to, and it could be part-time or full-time. And so I'd encourage you to start out that way. You might be able to negotiate that you could run a few cows or farm a few acres on your own behalf and utilize some of their equipment and those type of things as a, a benefit for you as well. If you are desiring to get into management, you know, work into a farm manager, uh, work for an absentee man, uh, as a uh, on the farm manager for an absentee manager as well. But the number one thing in this whole number two is communication. I just, there cannot be enough communication um, between the entities that are trying to work together. And so the more you can communicate, and I mean verbal communication, not cell phones and not text messaging and those type of things, um, you just really need to have that communication. There's so much under, misunderstanding um, in the communication world. So with these type of things, you may say, well, I'm not gonna go into production agriculture. I might wanna be in support of agriculture in a different field. And so I just, sat and kind of worked a random list of some opportunities in agriculture outside of production agriculture. And so number one, you need to have a good egg business banker that you can work with and so that you can communicate with and work uh, in those areas. Um, in my case, I have number two is a, a cattle partner. I work with Lone Creek Cattle Company out of Lincoln, Nebraska. And that's where my Piedmontese cattle um, go to. And you can order it, Piedmontese.com, if you want to buy some of our beef. You're more than welcome to. Um, they'll send it directly to your doorstep. Um, and so we just encourage you uh, to do that. Um, direct marketing, my calves go from birth on our operation, I feed them for 60 to 90 days, then they go to Lone Creek Cattle Company's feedlot, then they go to your, your plate. And so that's how direct um, this, uh, or streamlined, working with Lone Creek Cattle Company is. They handle about 20 to 25,000 head of calves a year, and so that is their market opportunity. And um, if you wanna know more about it, I'll be happy to. I also work with an agronomist each and every day, um, we talk about chemical, we talk about fertilizer, we talk about seed, we talk about our crops, if they're good, they're bad, what we need to do different. Um, I talk to our animal nutrition person, um, and he's based in Glendive, and so um, we do a lot of text and verbal communication as well as on site. Number one, we probably talk more to our parts and mechanics than I ever care to desire. And so, but um, they're very vital to your operation. And so again, this 
you know, and you might say, well, how does my degree relate to that? You don't always have to be the mechanic, but you can be the parts person or a support staff for GPS or the other opportunities within, the, within their operation. And it's, it, for me, it's always best to go to the parts person that is either on a farm or grew up on a farm because they understand what you're looking for and what part of the tractor you might be talking about or the combine or which, whatever is out there. We talk to our fuel and oil suppliers um, to make sure we're staying up with our supplies on hand. Uh, visiting with the local elevators for product delivery to them, also in pricing. Um, our animal health staff are the veterinarians and artificial insemination people that come to our operation. We inseminate about 200 head of cows a year, and so it's a very intense June um, to try to make all that happen. Um, I spend quite a bit of time talking with state and federal government agencies. I do um, lease land. I have federal land, BLM land, as well as federal game and fish land. And so you need, each one has its own set of rules, and so you need to work with them. And then they are also most of the time trying to improve the quality of your grass. So the more conversations you can have with these people, the better off for both entities. I've also, because of the state and federal government relationship, we work with the nonprofit agencies such as Audubon, Dakota, Ducks Unlimited, Pheasants Forever, and so they provide quite a bit of funding sources for you. And so I would encourage you, um, if you're looking for a job, there's a lot of positions within those organizations that interact with agriculture. Um, and then we deal with a number of trades. Um, you can be a land property appraiser, abstract staff, um, because there you're doing all kinds of legal work in order to make things happen. And then mineral resource people um, are another possibility that goes on. But I think at times we, you know, especially in the central part of America, we, we think mostly about production agriculture as farming and ranching. And I think we really need to think beyond that. And there's a lot of opportunity, and I'm just as guilty of not trying to think of those type of things. But you may want to think about a fish farm, and we've heard about fish farms at times, and then they go away. But I think there's a strong opportunity um, to start some very unique um, businesses within that. And it's deemed agriculture, and so, so for example, there's a fish farm called Blue Water Farms Walleye in Red Wing, Minnesota. And they're starting to raise walleye for restaurants and uh, grocery stores and those type of things. It doesn't take a large amount of land. It takes, they reuse the water and those type of things, so it doesn't take as much water to do to produce the fish. They've also figured out a way to produce walleye quicker, faster, bigger in a shorter period of time so it gets to market. And so the unique thing, and then they're very direct marketing as well, is they're, they're going from their ponds to the processing plant to your plate. That's how direct that whole opportunity is. But we have an opportunity here in Western North Dakota to be a part of this fish farm. If we um, uh, raise omega-3 canola, that's what they want to feed their fish. And they're going to take the omega-3 out of the, the canola, and that's going to be their fish food. And then the canola will be turned to oil. And so it's a new opportunity that's just coming about. And so it's something to, to think about um, how you, we can be related to a fish farm five, 600 miles away from here. And so the other one that I'll just talk about is called Vertical Harvest Farms. And that's an urban hydroponic farm. And there's a large scale one in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, of all places. <clears throat> and so um, their whole discussion is 80% of the farmland in America is already, or worldwide is already in use. Most of our food travels 2,500 miles to get to our plate. 95% of all of the leafy lettuce uh, type products that we like to have for salads and things come from California or Arizona. 
And so if there's only 5% that's produced elsewhere. And so they deliver produce from their farm to fork um, in 24 hours or less. Um, their whole production takes up about one-tenth of one acre. It's about five stories tall, and it's a revolving um, hydroponic farm on the inside. They pr produce the desired products 365 days a year at their peak nutritional value, and they employ about 40 employees uh, for underserved workers in the Jackson Hole, Wyoming region. I saw this first on CBS Sunday Morning Show. I've done research on it, and it's very, very interesting um, to look at, excuse me. They have about four of these um, across the United States. And I, last night when I was writing a little bit of this, um, it's the first time that the Jackson Hole plant has shut down for two weeks in seven years. And they just wanted to do a nice clean job and then start fresh. And so they asked everyone to be patient for two weeks and then they'll have product uh, back on the market. And so, um, so these are some things that I think we need to think about outside of what we deem as traditional agriculture. And right here in Dickinson in Western North Dakota, we can think about Baker Boy, we can think about Bobcat, Cloverdale, even Fisher Industries uses people from agriculture to work um, with their projects and things. And so I just encourage you not to be always so honed in on what we deem as production or traditional agriculture in, in North Dakota and the, the Midwest region. There's lots of opportunities to be involved. And so there's many, many opportunities in agriculture, and I just encourage you to keep exploring and find the fit that best serves you. And the last thing to wrap this up, um, this is my favorite saying. Um, it was written by Spike Van Cleve. He wrote a book called A, a Day Late and a Dollar Short. And I just encourage you, it's from a rancher's perspective in Montana, he's passed away. But he always said there's three ways to do things. There's the easy way, the hard way, and then there's dad's way. And dad's way makes the easy way look hard. And so it's just one of those things, that's how we live and learn and uh, the greatness of agriculture. So with that, I thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. So. If they have questions, we'll ask them okay. to speak here. Is this on or do I need to turn it on? It's on. Ah, it's on. Very good. <laughs> All right. Questions for our speaker. And if you do have one, give me time to come to you so that we can capture the question as well as his response. Any questions? Yes. Miss Molly. So you were talking about the opportunities with the fish farm. Have you thought about taking advantage of that with your operation? As of now, um, I'm looking at raising the canola for the fish farm, and then potentially you could look down, you know, downstream, uh, so to speak, and, and to see if there's a possibility to implement it here. And so, the, the, from my vantage point, the having it in Red Wing, Minnesota, you're about um, 40 miles from Minneapolis, so you have your large market areas already built into your opportunity where we would have the transportation challenges um, to get it there. But it's, it's something that I think everyone, you know, needs to explore. And so at now I'd say I'm just looking more at helping to supplement what they're trying to do. Get a little more out of what you're already right. doing. Right, right. Yep. Anyone else? Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Sorry, Kevin, you talked about the importance of technology. When you look back, high school, college years, did you think it was an important thing at that time? Or has this been just since you have taken over? No, um, the technology was, I would say my parents and grandparents were always looking at ways to enhance and to develop our farm in a different way and to try to make things easier and technology was a part of it. So, and it's just how things work, but my dad had the first swather in Bowman, North Dakota region, period. 
And so, I mean, you don't think of that as technology, but it was modern technology in 1972. And he was custom hired out to swath because everyone else used a mower bar. And so it's just looking at those type of things. He had one of the first round balers in our area. And so there's those type of technologies that came about. And then my dad was on the school board in Bowman for many, many years. And he pressed the importance of um, computer technology um, to the school system. He fought the superintendent of schools because they didn't think it was important to have computers. And dad felt it was very important to have computers. And then he, at that time, I was working up here at Dickinson State, and dad would interact with me um, asking about my viewpoint of computers. And so that's the only time we ever spoke about school was with just myself and dad. Um, mom, my mom was a school teacher, and there was always a conflict. And so we never talked about <laughs> school at the dinner table. It was always dad and I in a pickup, and if mom and dad talked about it, I never knew about it, so. <laughs> Kevin, you talked about uh, several generations, and you alluded to some parts of transition. Some of these in the audience will actually go back to the farm. Is there some uh, points, additional points you'd like to say about help in these transitions and family members and siblings and that type of thing that might add to your comment? I guess I just go back to communication, um, trying to be uh, more open um, in communication and what everyone feels to try to keep everyone on the same page. Um, I, I feel that's one of the biggest um, challenges with my operation. And the hard part with my operation is I'm a single person. And so it's, um, and with my parents both passing in the last couple of years, it's really brought it to the forefront. And so yes, I do have a plan. I encourage you, I don't care if you're 25, I encourage you if you have any farm or ranch um, materials or those type of things. I encourage you, number one, to have a health directive, number two, to have a power of attorney, and number three, to have a will. So you, it's all carried out and you know how to do it. And I don't care how young you are, I feel you need that. And to be honest with you, I'm working with some 85-year-old people that don't have any of it. And so, and they have no children. And so I'm coaching, I feel, on this. Uh, uh, area and so it's it's very important to have your legal documents ready, but it's also very important to have the discussions within your family, um, so that everyone knows the mode of operation if something happens. I don't know if that's other questions. So, Mr. Thompson, just out of curiosity, with your Lone Creek Cattle Company uh, contracts and stuff, does you, do you get paid on a not a per hundred ba per hundred weight basis, or is it more of your when they, the direct sale happens between consumer to from website to consumer? Okay, how my contract works um, is basically you contract X number of cows will be bred. And so then um, you report the number of calves that are in um, production and those type of things. And so um, the contract pays me when I deliver the calves. And I can deliver them in one shot, two shots, 10 shots if I wanted to. They come and pick them up. I don't even have to deliver them. They, they pick them up off my place. Um, the contract is basically um, I get the uh, average price of the number one steer calves in North Dakota a week prior of shipping. So if I ship on December 15th, it's the average price as of December 8th. And then I get the same price for heifer calves as I do a steer calf. And there's no commission. And then I get $200 per head bonus on top of every calf. 
So this, and, and it's not to, just to give you an example, this year I'm expecting about $2,000 per head for every calf across my place. And every calf that's contract, or every, every contract. calf from a contracted cow. Right. And so the one thing you have to keep in mind is that I told you earlier all the different verifications and certifications that I have. So if I give one calf a shot, that calf is out of the program. Fortunately, this year I've only had two. So, <laughs> and they're in the feedlot, and I typically ship um, the first group of calves about Christmas, either a day or two before Christmas or a day or two after, and then I ship the, the last group about the first of February. And then I get about six weeks off, and then we start calving again. So, so I don't get it off. I get to do other things. <laughs> so what drives your decision about when to ship? Is it the amount of feed you have? You make more money if, if they weigh heavier? Um, you have, according to the contract, you, I have to background them at least 45 days. So you can't just ship them directly off the cow. And you can feed them up to 800 pounds on average. And so you can play, and you can play the market if you want. You don't have to ship them in December. But unfortunately, I have some bills that come due in the month of December. And so that's kind of how my planning has evolved. And it doesn't mean I would have to ship them in December. Last year, it just about didn't happen because we could hardly get a truck into the yard. <laughs> and so it, was, it got pushed to the 29th of December. But the unique thing with Lone Creek Cattle Company is um, they don't even mail you a check. They just uh, ACH and wire the funds directly to my account. And so, as, so I ship, you don't sort calves, so you don't have sort um, steers and heifers or any of those type of things. You just run how the truckers want them on the truck and by group. And then when they get off the truck at the feedlot, the EID tag is red. And then the next morning I get a list of all the EID tags. So I don't even read them at my house. I just let them read them. They send me a whole Excel spreadsheet that I pour back into Cattle Max and I know which calves have been taken out or, or sold, and then um, I technically sell them within the Cattle Max program. And so um, it's a pretty um, unique and good opportunity. The one thing I do like with Lone Creek Cattle Company is they visit our operation about four times a year. So it's not like, we're in Lincoln, come and see us if you want. I do want to go see them because they have one of the top restaurants in the United States. <laughs> and that's part of their corporate headquarters. And so, so they've invited me for supper, but it's a heck of a long way, 700 miles for supper. So, um, but we'll do that one of these times. Any other questions? For a guy that was only going to talk 20 minutes, this is working good. <laughs> Not to get technical on you, but uh, a couple of the students in the audience are in a range management class and looking at rotation systems. And you've mentioned a, a system that I wasn't familiar with. We've looked at vents and nor vents, but the one you mentioned we're not familiar with. Um, our initial reaction is it's just too expensive. We can't afford it. So that's one question. The other question is you mentioned right side or left side, and this is the first one I mentioned that is directionally capable. Right. Um, so I've been working with the federal game and fish. It's on, I lease land on what's called Stewart Lake Wildlife Refuge. And so I've leased that for a number of years and with the federal game and fish, and they brought in the Ducks Unlimited people. And so um, it's pretty cool. Another part of technology, pretty cool with the ducks people when you're out there, is on, their, on your cell phone you can download bird calls. And so a bird's flying over our head and Dane's out there with his phone like this and he goes, oh, that's a black-legged something or another. And I'm like, I've never heard of that bird before. But I mean, that, that's the uniqueness of technology with working with other people in, in their professions. Um, but the Corel technologies that we're looking at, um, that we're going with, because we were going to go with vents. 
And that required towers, and that required cell signals, and that required a lot of things. And when you're working with federal agencies, they don't like footprint items like towers. So no towers could go on any of the federal land. So then you had to find either land property that I owned or neighbors owned in order to put the towers on. And then you, it's not only one tower, you need like four towers and each tower is 13 to $15,000 a tower. And so, um, and I give Dane with the Ducks Unlimited, he has interacted greatly with his Corel Technologies out of Nebraska, and they're the ones that have the collar. They're currently interacting with cell towers and then with your computer system, and, and so I have a 300-acre pasture, and we're breaking that down into um, nine different pastures. And, and so I can manage that from my home computer, they say your home computer is the best because of the screen is larger and those type of things. You can do it on your cell phone, but everything they say just gets a little too small on the phone at this point in time. And so, um, and then next year in 24, it's going to move from cell tower to satellite. And so there, it can be anywhere in the world. And it literally shocks the cow on the right hand side if, She's getting too close to that boundary or the left hand. And they said you can move them down a lane in between fields and direct them that way too, as long as you have it all set up. And so um, it's gonna be a learning curve for me and a learning curve for the cows, and, um, but I'm excited for it. Um, I, you know, I don't mind electric fence, but it's a pain to put up and a pain to take down. And, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. The other unique thing about this um, corral technologies and all of those technologies is if a cow stays in the same spot for too long, it sends you an alert saying cow number 204 has been in the same location for the following t too long. And so, um, so then you can go look and see if she's all right or if she's sick. The other thing that, there, and I haven't heard the research on this because I was asking them if, if these collars could be put on bulls. And I was worried about the bulls mounting and those type of things and then tearing the collars off. And they're taking the research and they were to do the research at Uni University of Nebraska and Texas A&M this summer. But they are trying to take it to the next level that if you have two or more bulls in one pasture that they can tell you which bull bred which cow. On which day? On which day. And just think how that would impact operations, especially registered operations, when you're doing cleanups and different things, if you could tell. Um, so it's, it gets pretty high tech. And it's a neat high tech, in my opinion. But it's also scary on the backside because then it's like, how much more do they know about us? And if we're so worried about the cows, how do they know about us too? So. Can you put those on teenagers? Right. <laughs> one last question, anyone? I, I do have one quick one. So you're, you're obviously well-read and, and aware of new and emerging technologies. And you don't leave Bowman very often, apparently. So uh, how do you do that? Where do, you, where do you find your information and how much time in a day do you spend learning about new things versus doing chores? Um, I usually, I am always have been an early riser and so I get up about 5, 5.30 every day and I read from that time I get ready and then I read basically from then till 7 o'clock. And so um, I have various online uh, newspapers. I encourage you to it's not a slam against the local papers, but I encourage you to have a, a nationwide paper that you read. Um, I read the Wall Street Journal every day, and so I don't read it cover to cover, but I encourage you to do that. Um, there are, <laughs> this week, if we had more time, I'd tell you the troubles that China is becoming, um, not becoming to us, becoming to themselves, and it's all been played out in the Wall Street Journal this week. They predict China's, population will decrease in half by 2050, 2060. And it's because of all the decisions that the policymakers made in China 40 years ago. That every family could only have one child. 
Then they finally figured out that they could have two childs. Now they want them to have three, and no one wants to have a chi uh, child. And then very, f uh, a lot of the women are not able to have children. And the other thing that happened 40 years ago is everyone wanted a male. They did not want females. So they don't have enough of the population mix to create new families. And so it's very important. The other thing that's related back to agriculture in a different story that was in the Wall Street Journal, they don't have enough people in rural China to operate their farms because they moved everyone to the city. So now they're trying to get people to move from the city back to the farms. And that's having moderate luck. Success. <laughs> Success, luck, however you want to do it. And so those are some things that you need to do. It's, I, you know, I look at Facebook a lot, uh, and um, not that that's a savior of anything, but it's one of those things that if you have certain articles or magazines to pop up, you can get real good, quick reads. And, and then if you want to go back and read in depth, you can do that. So, so those are some things. My dad was a reader. He read a book a day. And growing up as a, as a kid in Bowman, North Dakota, I said we were the best um, area of North Dakota because we got the Minneapolis Tribune every day on the train on the same day. We got um, our radio stations were out of Montana. Our TV was out of South Dakota and Denver. And we had one uh, KFYR out of Bismarck. And so we knew more about the whole surrounding state of North Dakota years ago. We know, knew more then than we know now. And that's the unfortunate change of technology and how um, the interaction of the of, uh, newspaper and media and those type of things because all of our medias are owned by companies outside of the the region and so they're given the can report here's the stories you have to cover today it's not the story of north dakota today or the story of dickinson today so anyway let's thank our speaker <laughs> We're going to start with our first of six. Uh, don't know that they're all graduating seniors, but the but, uh, majority of them are planning to graduate in the fall, completing their senior projects. One of the things that they have to accomplish is a public presentation. And the first of those six are going to be presented by Nathan Schumacher. Nathan's from uh, Grand Forks, North Dakota. His uh, 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 presentation today is entitled Soybean Varieties in Western Minnesota and Eastern North Dakota. Mr. Schumacher. Thank you, Dr. Pollan. Uh, again, I'm Nathan Schumacher, and I would like to thank all of you for being here today. So soybean production in America, uh, expected yield is 49.6 bushels per acre. Uh, just for some reference, a bushel is about the size of a laundry basket, and one acre is roughly the size of a football field. Um, on average in America, 4.3 billion bushels are harvested each year. In 1980, for North Dakota, that average was 3.5 million bushels. Today in North Dakota, it is up to 191 bushels. Um, that puts North Dakota in the top 10, uh, coming in at number eight. And I put this picture over here as a guide so you can just kind of see where at in America that soybeans are produced. So the importance of soybeans, um, they are used for creation of biodiesel, carpet, candles, ink, uh, they are also add nutrients to our foods. Um, there's been studies conducted that the soybeans have shown to reduce, reduce risk of heart disease. And not only are they a good source of food for humans, but they are a good source of food for animals as well. So conducting the study, the main thing I wanted to look at was what varieties of soybeans are going to yield the best. And this picture here is uh, from one of our locations of growing soybeans. Extend flex soybeans. Uh, these are uh, double stack soybeans, so that means they have two traits, two genetically modified traits. Um, they are decamba and glyphosate 
tolerant, which means that the plant has these traits embedded within the seed, and it allows the plant itself to metabolize this product internally without being harmed by it. The dicamba product used in this study was a product called Ingenia. Uh, Ingenia is kind of a weird product. There's selective spray dates on it because it's, it's something called inversion. There's an acidic molecule, molecule within the product, and so when hot air rises up into the atmosphere, the product will rise with it, and when it moves around and then it cools down, it'll settle again, and when it settles, who knows where it went, and it won't be over your field causing issues. So the spray dates on those are June 19th, and if there's issues getting into the field and getting your field planted, they can be pushed back to a later date of June 29th. The glyphosate uh, product used in this study is a Roundup Ready called PowerMax 3. PowerMax 3 is used for weed control, where Ingenia is used for weed control, but also some insect control as well. So there's four locations used during this study, uh, Euclid, Minnesota, Crookston, Minnesota, and then two locations in Valley City, Minnesota, or Valley City North Dakota. Uh, all four locations had loam, loamy soil types with a little difference in some of them. This picture here is a picture of the plot in Crookston, Minnesota. I want to put this picture up for reference so you could see where these locations are. So the methods used for this study was the agronomists that I work with, um, they came up with what varieties they wanted to be put in these plots. <clears throat> there was multiple varieties in each. The two Valley City plots had 25 varieties in each of them. The Crookston had 13 varieties and Euclid had 15 varieties. Uh, the fields were sprayed with PowerMax 3 uh, before emergence. And roughly a month and a half later, we came back and sprayed them with Ingenia. Uh, at the time of harvest, yield and grain moisture percentage data was collected. So amongst the four locations, there were six common varieties. Uh, the brands that we used were Allegiant, NK, and Asgrow. The two Allegiant varieties were O3F12N and O7F EXP. That one is kind of unique. It's a brand new variety. It's not even on the market yet. This was the first year that it's been put into a field and um, we expected good things out of this variety. The NK varieties were O5W3XF and O6P2XF and the Asgrove varieties were O2XF4 and O4XF4. Plant population in Valley City plots was 144,000 seeds per acre. In Crookston and Euclid, it was 160,000 seeds per acre. Uh, your plant population is important because when you have higher population, your yields tend to increase. There's also a fine line because if you go over that population, it will have an effect and decrease your yields. Uh, when you plant a field, you can expect to have 80% survival rate. Some situations that that survival rate is above that 80% and some is below. Uh, all four plots were planted with 22 inch row spacing and seed depth was 1.5 inches. So some results, these are the raw results from this study. Uh, as you look across the board, Euclid had the greatest yielding crop out of all of it except for the NK06. Uh, there was one location where that yielded better, and that was in Valley City 1. Uh, varieties grain moisture percentage. As you can see again, Euclid was very consistent across the board. Um, one thing I really wanted to point out about this was if you look at this 07F experimental variety, this came in at 15.6%, uh, which is a lot higher than all the other percentages on the board. Um, we don't really know why, and this was kind of made you bad an eye when we got this information because Crookston was the one location that had the least amount of rainfall throughout the season. Um, it just goes so show, and you, we came up with a conclusion that this variety really spans out and goes after moisture. 
effects of varieties on yield. Uh, P-value suggested that there's not a difference amongst these. Um, these error bars suggest the variance, and if you look, the the Allegiant 07F experimental came in at our second, which the N behind the NK06, which we knew the NK06 was a very good variety. It has been for a couple of years on the market, and a lot of farmers have began to use it. Effects of varieties on moisture. Uh, the p-value also suggested that there is no difference here. Um, if you look at this right here, this Allegiant, the 07F experimental, that one is a little higher because of the 15.6% kind of shot it up above the rest of them. And these are percentages in decimal form. Effects of location on yield. Um, the, there was a difference among these. Um, as you can see, the Euclid plot was the greatest, followed by Valley City 1, and then Val or Crookston, and then Valley City 2. Um, we were kind of surprised to see this because, like I said, Crookston had the least amount of rainfall throughout the season, and it was very dry, and we were kind of expecting that one to be the least. Effects of location on grain moisture percentages. These are also no different. Um, we ran this study multiple times because for Euclid Valley City 1 and Valley City 2, it showed the same number and that just didn't seem right. But after doing it over and over again, we always came up with that 0.113. And Crookston is a little bit below these three, as you can tell, for the reason that they had the least amount of moisture throughout the growing season. In conclusion of this study, uh, yield was affected by locations, uh, greatest in Euclid, followed by Valley City 1, least in Valley City 2, followed by Crookston. Some of these differences for why this was could have been rainfall throughout the growing season, um, little difference in soil types, and just different growing conditions. Grain moisture was not affected by variety or location, and yield was not affected by variety. Some things I would change if I were to do this study again, I would definitely add more locations. Um, I think that would help me out with the p-values and helping to suggest that there is a difference among them. Uh, I would add more varieties in this study so you have more to compare to. Uh, I, would, I would change this study and do a three to five year study for the reason being that one year you might have a very wet year, the next is a drought, and the year after that is in between. Uh, just give you a better look at overall throughout different growing seasons. Um, another thing is information on fertilizer used. I did not have this information available to me, and I think that f the fertilizer used before the crops were put into the ground has an effect on how crops grow. And the last thing is I would conduct soil tests at all different locations. I would like to thank Dr. Woodrow, Chip Poland, and Mr. Tobias Stroh as they immensely helped me with this project. I would not have been able to do this without these two. Um, I would also like to thank CHS Ag Services of Crookston, Minnesota. With an internship there this past summer, uh, they allowed me to tend to and look over the Crookston and Euclid plots and grow my knowledge on the growing of soybeans and different varieties and how all that works. The two agronomists from that location, Chris Dufault and Todd Summerfield, uh, those two were very active in this project and helping me out. It didn't matter when I called them with a question, and if they didn't know the answer, they told me they'd get back to me and they did very fast. And lastly, I would like to thank the farmers who allowed us their fields and the data off their combines. Any questions? We can certainly take a couple questions with our speakers. They're actually ready for them, so any questions for our first speaker? Ms. Molly. Do you think the climate of these three different locations, because two of them were in Minnesota and one of them were in North Dakota, do you think that played a large role in your results? 
I wouldn't necessarily say a large role. It definitely could have played a small role into it, but they're semi close to each other in the aspect of the region to where they typically had the same climate throughout the growing season. Having looked at these varieties, do you have a personal preference of what variety you would use? Uh, personally, I would use the NK06, or I would I would look at using the new um, uh, Allegiant 07F Experimental once it hits the market. Any other questions? With that, why don't we thank our speaker? Thank you. Our next speaker hails from Richardson, North Dakota. Skylar Dressler is here to report on his work entitled, Does Backgrounding Performance Influence Subsequent Grazing Performance of Replacement Beef Heifers in Southwestern North Dakota? Mr. Dressler. Thank you, Toby. Uh, I mean, Chip, sorry. <laughs> As Chip just stated, my name is Skylar Dressler. Uh, we have a ranch north of Richardson, about 17 miles. And as also, as you just stated, the question I want to ask or answer was, does backgrounding performance influence subsequent grazing performance of beef replacement heifers in southwest North Dakota? Um, a few terms I want to go over before we get started. Um, average daily gain will be ADG. Pounds is LBS. Backgrounding is BKG. Head is HD, acres is AC, and a few more. AUM is an animal unit month, and acre per AUM is the acres needed to support a thousand pound cow with or without a calf. A little bit of history. In, in 2022, there was 93.9 million head of cattle in the US and 1.75 million head in North Dakota alone. Replacements are used to replace old or open cows in a herd, in the producer's herd, and backgrounding period is necessary to allow for grow, gain, and overall body condition score. Um, a, a heifer is used to describe a young fertile cow who has not calved yet. Uh, replacement should be about 12 to 14 months of age when it is selected. It needs to be about 55 to 65 percent of its overall weight before being bred and it needs to reach the age of puberty at 15 months to have a calf at two years old. Uh, what you're looking for when you're selecting a heifer is you want you look at the size at weaning. Um, typically they have some small tail enders you don't necessarily think they'll make the best cut. Uh, you'll have some bigger ones sometimes they end up going on contracts so you're kind of stuck with the ones in the middle. Uh, you want fast growing, good natured, you want them healthy, uh, you want them hardy as well, meaning uh, especially up here in North Dakota, uh, you want it to be able to survive just fine on its own. Uh, you want good calving ease, uh, age, and pelvic size. So the objective of this was to determine if growth performance during backgrounding period influences the growth um, of beef heifers on the pasture and then analyze average daily gain between backgrounding and grazing periods. Location is, it was at the Dressler Ranch north of Richton, about 17 miles, uh, also located just east of Marshall. So here is the two feed yards that were used um, to feed them all winter long. The one in the red outline has two hay feeders pointed out with the gray arrows. Uh, they typically have alfalfa grass bales right away um, more so when we start running out of that, just kind of give them some oats bales, a little bit of mixture. And there's a water tank down on the bottom of the screen. In the purple outline, you have seven feed bunks and a storage shed where the creep feed is kept. So for the pastures that were used in this, the home place is up there in the blue arrows and the north pasture is about 1.3 miles away from home. Um, and that's about 200 acres, and then the blue outline is a south pasture, which is about 300 acres, and that was the other pasture used in this. So procedure, they were weaned on November 11th of 2022. Um, they were given the second rounds of vaccinations, and then 92 calves are weighed for the first initial weights. They were then sorted by sex, and the given alfalfa grass bales for around 200 days, and then they were also given oats bales 
for the remaining 62 days along with alfalfa grass bales. Um, so the Crete feed was fed daily with a target average daily gain of one and a half pounds per day. Uh, they were fed for all 262 days that they were in there. On May 8th, 39 calves were weighed for the middle weights between the backgrounding and before they were put out to grass, and then they were turned out to grass. Then they were on grass for 117 days, and the final weights were taken on October 2nd, and then the 29 calves were weighed that time, and only 24 were used for this project. So to give you a little idea about the Crete feed, the Crete feed we use is the payback Crete feed from CHS. And we want to give them about three and a half pounds per calf. Uh, there's 24 calves, you give them three and a half pounds, it's 84 pounds. Um, we use five gallon buckets, we don't have any fancy technology to measure that for us. And a five gallon bucket when it's full is about 30 pounds of Crete feed. So that we would need about three five gallon buckets full to feed them 24 calves. So the benefits of this creep feed from payback, it's got high protein, advanced fiber formulation, uh, copper and zinc for improved trace mineral, excellent palatability for better consumption. Calves tend to gain about 70 to 100 pounds more when they are on it compared to ones that aren't, and calves start and stay healthier. This picture might be hard to see, but uh, the crude protein of this is about 15%, the crude fat is 3%, and the crude fiber is also about 15%. 18%, sorry. So for the pastures, uh, they were out there from May 8th to October 2nd. Um, it got roughly about 13 point inches. Uh, I just got it off a, of a weather history type thing online and gave me kind of what we got. Uh, so it was on 520 acres and then using web soil survey, I used to calculate the forage production on those pastures. And to total forage production on it on a normal year is 997,000 pounds and the average production per acre is about 1,900 pounds. Uh, so they were out there for 117 days on 29 yearlings, which were about 800 pounds on 520 acres. So what they were actually getting for acre per AUM is 5.8. So the results. So here are the weights, the initial, middle, and final weights. Um, the initial, this is the first one, it was taken right before they were put into the backgrounding, meaning right at weaning they were taken, and they averaged about 460 to 467 pounds with a standard deviation of 92. Uh, the middle weights, which was taken right uh, after backgrounding and right before they went out to pasture, they weighed about 763 pounds with a standard deviation of 124 pounds. And then the final weight, which was taken um, when they were brought in to be pregnancy tested, and they weighed about 970 pounds with a standard deviation of 124 pounds. Those, those blue bubbles you see at the top there, those are just some outliers, the ones that weighed more than what would fit in the box there, and then same with that one that just didn't do as good as the other ones. So here are the average daily gains. Uh, the first one is the average daily gain in backgrounding in pounds per day. Uh, they've, so they gained about 1.3 pounds per day in the backgrounding alone with a standard deviation of 0.32. And then the second one is the grazing, and they gained about 1.76 pounds per day with a standard deviation of 0.65. And the average daily gain overall, which is through the whole project, through the, all, all the backgrounding and all the grazing, they gained about 1.32 pounds per day, standard deviation of 0.26. Here is the scatter plot chart uh, showing on, on the x-axis, the backgrounding and the y, the grazing, each blue dot represents one calf. Um, the gains were negatively correlated with an R value of 0.22, and the slope of this relationship was minus 0.45, meaning for every one pound gain they did in the backgrounding was a half pound less they gained in the grazing. Conclusion. Um, so heifer performance during backgrounding was negatively influenced subsequent performance on grazing, pat, on summer grazing. Little additional research opportunity. Um, I'd like to have a larger group of calves on this. Uh, part of the problem was ear tags. Uh, a bunch of the ear tags ended up falling out, so it was hard to keep track of them through all, getting all three weights. I know they make ear tags that you can snap in instead of, we just use the easy Z tags, they just punch right in, they can easily fall right back out. 
Um, another thing too is maybe seeing if I could get another rancher along. I know there's um, one of the people that helped me with this is Kelly Dressler. His brother-in-law uses the same creep feed and then puts them on pasture as well. So it'd be interesting to see if I could get him to allow me to do this too. Uh, I'd want to look at the forage production in the pasture, actually go out there and see instead of just having a calculator of what it would be, go out and do some clipping, see what's all there. Um, I'd also like to get the pastures out to have or the calves out to pasture longer earlier too, get them out May 1st, get them on that crested wheat right away, and then have them out a little bit longer before I get second waves because I only got it for 117 days on grazing, so it'd be in 262 in the background, so it'd be nice to have those days a little more closer. Uh, acknowledgements, uh, Kent and Kelly Dressler, which is my grandfather, and his brother, they, uh, they allowed me to do this and taking the extra time to uh, actually take the weights. Um, Dr. Woodrow Chip Poland on analyzing all my data and helping me get through all of this, and Mr. Tobias Stroh as well as helping me get started and finish this project. Any questions? Yeah, maybe this works now. <clears throat> Very good. Questions for our speaker? You know, their challenge with having a one that's slightly short is it provides more opportunity for you to ask questions. He's going to help me over there. Any questions? What breed of cattle were you using? We're going to bring this right back so we can capture that question. What, what breed of cattle were these? It was mostly black Angus. There's a few red in there too, but it was just multi, mostly black. And we coach them that there is not a black Angus. There's an Angus and a red Angus. The Angus ones happen to be black. Therefore, a black Angus. No. <laughs> that would be like me calling you the, uh, the red-headed Skylar. I've heard worse. Any other questions? Ah. Did you raise your hand? Raise your hand? <clears throat> Did you have a question? Skyler, would the results of your study suggest that you change any of the management or feeding programs that you use? Mm. Well, with me wanting to get them out to pasture a little bit sooner, it might, uh, it'll, it's going to take away from some of the backgrounding. So I'd maybe towards the end bump it up just a little bit on the gain or the, what we desired to gain. Our, what we actually gained didn't meet what we wanted to actually gain. We wanted to get 1.5, and we actually got 1.13. But I would probably maybe bump it up a little more towards the end of maybe two pounds so that we actually get to what we want, that 55 to 65 percent of the mature weight, which is about 800 pounds, which is what mostly, most of them are at when we weighed them. This is the problem with leaving too much time. <laughs> Do you know the results of your preg checking on these, and was there any correlation to how they gained and bred up? Uh, to answer the correlation, I don't exactly know if there would be. It's not exactly the study that I did. Um, but there was a 93% um, success rate on pregnancy on those 29 heifers. One last one, if there are any. If not, let's thank our speaker. Adelie Spielman from uh, Miles City, North Dakota. Had an opportunity to work at the ARS station in Miles City or work with uh, a scientist from the ARS station in Miles City. She's reporting on their work of the impact of various litter amounts on soil moisture and temperature at different precipitation rates on rangeland. Ms. Thanks. Spielman. Thank you, Dr. Poland. I'm going to correct that. I am from Miles City, Montana. I don't know that there is one in North Dakota. Very good. Uh, I did my report on the impact of various litter amounts on soil moisture and temperature at various different precipitation rates on rangeland, as Dr. Poland said. So this is in Miles City. Uh, if you're looking at a map of Montana where that nice yellow star is, is roughly the location, so it's in southeastern Montana, specifically um, Fort Keogh. The part of Fort Keogh that we did our trial in is this little section up here. If I'm correct, I'm fairly certain that's where it was. And the middle picture is just what you would see from an aerial perspective of what the plots look like. 
So for some background information, um, rangeland is defined as lands on which the indigenous vegetation is predominantly grasses, forbs, and possibly shrubs or dispersed trees. Uh, the NRCS defines it as that. Litter, for the sake of this trial, is defined as any form of dead or senesced plant material that you would find covering bare ground. Soil temperature is obviously the temperature of your soil that you would have, and soil moisture is the water percent volume of your soil. The objective of this trial was to determine the impact that litter and precipitation had on soil moisture and soil temperature on rangeland. For materials and methods, uh, we had to use a lawnmower, just a regular push lawnmower, so we had to prepare the area so that we had all of the stubble removed. Uh, watchdog mini station, this is a form of probe that allows us to monitor uh, temperature and soil moisture. Save a drop water nozzle, which is the bottom photo here that allowed us to measure the gallons of water that went through the hose at the time when we were simulating rainfall. A drought exclosure, which is what we have in this lovely picture here. It is a shelter that prevents uh, what would be a normal precipitation rate from falling upon your plot. So this gives us about, I think, a 50% of what would be normal, which creates a drought. And we used straw to simulate litter. To set up the plot, there were nine plots, uh, three by three. Three were droughts or dry conditions. Three were an average rainfall that you would see, and three were a heavier rainfall that you would see as well. Uh, for the sake of the results, all of the average rainfall will be referred to as moderate, and all of the heavy rainfall will be referred to as wet. Uh, each plot was divided into four sections. We had zero grams per meter squared, 100 grams per meter squared, 200 grams per meter squared, and 300 grams per meter squared. What that looks like when you're looking at it in your pastures is we have the zero here, the 100 here, 200, and 300. So if you're wondering what you would potentially see related to what you have at home, that would be about the average coverage. The plots first set up so that we had drought for all of our yellow here. So we have them going at an angle. The white is ambient or moderate, which you would see averagely, and the green is a heavy rainfall year. Uh, the L1s through L4s are our litter treatments. So each plot, as I said, received four separate litter treatments. We tried to variate where those were. So L1 is zero, L2 is 100, L3 is 200, and L4 is 300. Um, on the 23rd of June, we began setting out the plots that required mowing the pasture so that all of the stubble was removed. We mowed it down to about five centimeters or two inches. We then had to proceed to rake all of the extra stubble off as it was a wetter year and there was more than anticipated. And we removed anything else that we could with a leaf blower. We then clipped the stubble in quadrants of about one fourth of a meter squared from the center of each plot. We used that to calculate our end stubble rates. We afterwards moved the drought shelters onto the appropriate drought plots, set up our soil readers. Our soil depth was taken at one to about two and a half inches, depending on the probe that was inserted at the time. So just a very surface level depth. On the 20th of July, we put down our litter. So we had a couple days of wait, but that's okay. And the 24th was our first watering day. So for our wet treatment, we did <coughs> 0 point, or 1.5 inches. And for our moderate, we put down 0 0.5 inches. Uh, our second watering was the 31st of July. We did 0.2 inches for our wet and 0.1 inches for our moderate or average rainfall. For our third, we did 0.3 inches for moderate and 0.4 inches for wet. And on the 11th of August, we collected our data and our, we analyzed it using SAS. The results. So the results from this show that we do have, for the most part, a fairly consistent similarity. So this is looking at each precipitation treatment. So 
we have obviously our outlier here at 100 within the precipitation treatment. Um, our outlier, and this is wet, our outlier for moderate or an average year is at 300. So it had more soil than we were seeing with the rest of the trend. And for dry, obviously, no water, nothing to hold the water in. You're going to have a little bit of an outlier compared to the rest of your data. Now, if we're comparing it by litter and looking at how the different precipitation rates compare to each other, obviously, we can see dry is very different here than these two, which are grouped together, which is wet and are moderate. Additionally, dry is down here, but these are all fairly spread apart so that we do not consider them to be similar at the 100 litter treatment rate. Back to having wet and moderate be similar for soil moisture at the 200 and again at the 300 with dry being different. For soil temperature, you see dry as obviously a higher soil temperature here. It is somewhat similar, however, at 100 to the wet and moderate. It is somewhat similar to the wet, but not to the moderate. Oh, no, sorry, that's the wrong one. This is somewhat similar to the 100 and the 200, or this one is similar to the zero and the 200, but it is not similar to itself within that plot. It is similar to zero and 100 are, but it is not similar to 200 and 300 within wet. And one, uh, zero is not similar to anything in moderate, nor is 300. With this one, this is the one where we were comparing. So none of them are the same or similar at all for 100 in terms of soil temperature. Uh, they are similar to each other for wet and moderate at the 100, but dry is dissimilar. Um, they're all dissimilar at the 200, and again, the wet and moderate are similar for temperature, but they are, dry is different again, which you would expect to see because no moisture, you only have, have what's already there. Now, <clears throat> this is kept factoring in our stubble and comparing how litter at different rates entirely is related to soil precipitation. As you can see from this line, we have a upward trend in moderate and dry, which means as you put down or have more litter on your pastures or rangeland, you are seeing an increase in soil water. With wet, we are seeing a decrease in soil water. This could just be because the litter is uptaking the moisture, so it is not able to infiltrate the soil at that heavy of a precipitation rate. For soil temperature, you are seeing a decrease in moderate and dry. For your temperatures, as the, um, as the litter goes down, for wet, you are seeing an increase. Uh, similarly, if there's not water to keep it cool, that could be what is causing the increase there. The conclusion of this, um, it was determined that from a p-value standpoint, there is no too little impact on um, soil moisture and temperature based on litter. Uh, the, notably, the dry trials frequently deferred, as you would expect to see, is there's no moisture and no way for it to get moisture aside from what's already there. Um, there were very few similarities in the soil temperature trials where there were similarities. It was between usually wet and moderate. Uh, increased litter led to a decrease in soil temperature, which is what you would expect to see, and we've been taught in classes. And there is a basis for further study, as all this data is preliminary. It was taken over a very short period of time, and if it was taken over a longer period of time, you would potentially expect to see a different outcome. I would like to thank the Fort Keogh Livestock and Range Research Laboratory for allowing me to conduct my study on their property. I would like to thank Dr. Lance Vermeer for talking me through the data many, many times. I would like to thank Mr. Dustin Strong for teaching me how to use a lot of this equipment, Dr. Woodrow Chip Poland for helping me and giving me advice on this, and Mr. Tobias Stroh for keeping me on task, Ms. Anna Higgins for photography, she was the one that took all these photos, and Mr. Austin Coots and Garrett Seeger for helping with pushing a lawnmower through a pasture. <laughs> Questions? Questions for our speaker. A lot of stuff to unpack and digest in a very short period of time. Do you think natural rainfall had an effect on the study? 
Yes, we, um, we did calculate natural rainfall into that as well for some of those, so it is factored in, but um, I think having the fact that it was a wetter year in general, it definitely impacted um, what was already there. So it impacted the preparation period as well as what the soil moisture already was. So um, is Fort Keogh going to continue doing this study, or was it a one and done kind of thing? Um, from my understanding, the study is currently still ongoing. Um, so it will be interesting to see what the results of that are with what they come up with. Anything else? It's like an auction. You have to be careful moving your hands or I'll bring the microphone. Anything else? If not, let's thank our speaker. We have the pleasure of having Taylor Downing with us today to talk about from uh, South Hart, Belfield, Fairfield, Fairfield uh, North Dakota. I'm right about this one. Uh, presenting on her senior project, Time of Feeding in Correlation to the Time of Day that Calving Occurs in Beef Cattle. Ms. Downing. Thank you. Mic test, mic test. You guys can hear me? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Poland, for that wonderful introduction. And the reason that I did this study is because North Dakota is a very production agricultural based state, the beef industry being one of those driving factors within that. And with that in mind, it is no secret, calving is a very stressful time of year across any operation. And we're always looking for new and innovative ways to find, to make, that, make stuff like that easier. And with that in mind, this question arose in my mind. Is there a direct relationship with that? Is there a way that we can implement this to make it simpler? And being from a line of generations or ranchers, this, part, this project plays a near and dear part to my heart as well. And now for a brief introduction so we're all on the same page as I go throughout this presentation. First and foremost, the objective of this study is to see if there's a direct relationship between the time of day a rancher feeds his or her cows and if that affects the time of day that she calves, also playing with that age factor in there as well. Because a young cow is gonna differ from an older mature cow, as those young cows have never been experienced with this, those older cows have been there, they've done that, and or have been there and done that. And also for some basic terminology, so we're all on the same page as I go through this presentation. Calving is the act of giving birth in cattle, much like a woman having a child, the rumen is the first compartment within the beef stomach, within a beef cow stomach. This is where the fermentation happens during the digestive process. Those microbes are observing, observing and breaking down the feedstuffs. And lastly, keeping in mind the study was done from February 2023 to May of 2023, some of these animals were still considered heifers as they had not had any offspring yet during that time. But throughout this, they did become cows, but mainly this term may or may not be used during this presentation. And if it is, we're all on that same page and know what that means. Now for my materials and methods. First and foremost, I'd ask four ranchers to keep track of the cow's identification number, the day she calved, what time she calved, the nearest half an hour, as we all cannot be out there 24 seven watching those cows, unless you have cameras, much like Mr. Thompson had mentioned that he has going on. Uh, additionally, I'd ask them to mark down, to give me an average time of when they fed their cows and a brief description of what their identification number system is. So that way the age of the cow could be calculated. After this was concluded, I have observed around 300 cows that are all within Southwest North Dakota with similar management practices as they all have Angus influenced cows. They're all fed grass hay at various times of the day and at various times of the day. Now for my feeding time groups, there is the AM group or the morning feeding group, the PM group or the night feeding group and the FC group or the free choice group. The morning group is fed between the hours of 7 to 9 a.m. They do this out of terms of convenience as they're very busy people. The PM group, which is fed between the hours of 7 to 9 p.m., they, they do this because they believe they can maximize the amount of cows that calve during the day if they feed at night. 
The free choice group, they have access to hay 24 hours a day. They do this simply in terms of convenience as the way their operation is set up. And these feeders are restocked in the morning, but again, those cows can come and go out of that feeder as they please. Now for the age groups, as you notice, there's only two of them. Just breaks of, off of maturity and just to really see a concrete difference between the two groups when I get into my results. Those young cows, they are between the ages of two to three as the, some of those three-year-olds could have been not bred till they were two. And also, they could still also be growing and maturing as well. With those four-year-olds and four years plus, they've already been there, they've had calves, they know what's going on, and they're already fully grown. Now from my calving time groups, there's a day group and the night group. Again, just to see a solid, a solid concrete difference between the times and how those feeding times affect the, the time that they calve. The day group is the hours at 6 a.m. to 5.59 p.m. The nighttime group is 6 p.m. to 5.59 a.m. And again, this is at that time of year, this is when the sun rises and the sun sets. Now for my results. Here we have the young cow comparison graph and I'm gonna qu quickly describe what's going on with these graphs so we all know as I go through this. As we can see here on the vertical axis, that is the head count, that's just simply how many cows fall within that group. The time of day fed, again, just showing along the horizontal axis, the time that these cows were fed. And the orange color represents the daylight group, again, those hours of 6 a.m. to 5.59 p.m. The blue is, represents that nighttime group, the hours of 6 p.m. to 5.59 a.m. Now, again, the a.m. group here, fed between the hours of 7 to 9 a.m the PM group of 7 to 9 PM. And lastly, the free choice group here, access to hay all day, every day. Now, as we're looking at this graph, we have a p-value here of 0.03, which tends to mean there is a statistical difference within this group. And that comes down to these two main groups right here. As we can see, those younger cows tended, as they were fed in the morning, tended to calve during the, ni during the night, if they were fed in the morning. The complete opposite happened with that PM group. Those that were fed at night tended to have more during the day. The free choice group over here, more of a nighttime tendency to calve. It just comes down to when did that cow stick her head in the feeder and take a bite? The mature cows, same thing follows suit with this graph. There's a p-value of a 0.2, meaning there's no statistical difference. However, we did tend to see more of a trend with this group. They really tended to not have any effect as to when they were fed to when they calved. As we can see here, those that were fed during the morning tended to calve more during the morning. Those that were fed at night tended again to calve more during the day. The free choice group, almost an even split, but with a nighttime more tendency leaning and calving, that just comes down to again, when did she decide to take a bite out of that feeder? Now for my age comparison graph. This graph shows comparing those young cows to those mature cows. Now, as we can see here, those young cows really drove that number up as they were fed at night, or fed in the morning, tended to calve more during the, day, during the night. Those that were fed at night tended to calve more during the day. I wish I had more cows within this group because that would probably be more of a statistical dip, or would show more of a difference. That free choice group here, Again, more of a nighttime leading tendency of calving. And as we can see here, statistically different because of the p-value of a 0.05. Now for my conclusion, why is this? So what it really comes down to is three things, the maturity of the cow and the rumen activity. As the Journal of Veterinary Medicine, Vet Medicine states, if there is no rumen activity going on, with that subsiding, it begins to put elevate those hormonal levels and it enacting that birthing process. And now, as we notice that difference with those younger cows, how does that play into them? Again, it really comes down into that growth and maturity. Those cows are still growing. They don't have a fully developed rumen. And with that in mind, they start taking in less feed because of that, because that uterus is pushing in on that rumen. And they, are, they will start taking in 17% less as what they usually eat a month prior to calving, according again to the Journal of Veterinary Medicine, causing them to 
causing those hormone levels to rise up, thus causing them to maybe think about calving, which also might entail why some of those heifers start going a little bit bonkers around this time of year too. And with that, I would like to thank the DSU Agricultural Department faculty, more specifically, Dr. Poland for helping me analyze my data, Mr. Tobias Stroh for helping not only myself, but my peers stay online and stay on task with this process, and the following ranches were helping me collect data. The Downing Ranch, operated by Jason and Tina Downing out of Fairfield, North Dakota. The Shook Ranch, out of New England, North Dakota, operated by Melvin and Sylvia Shook. The Rice Ranch, again out of that Fairfield country, operated by Cody and Julie Rice and family. And lastly, the Schulte Ranch, operated by Wyatt Schulte and Sadia Safar out of Hebron. With that, I would like to open the floor to questions. Oh. Questions for our speaker. Be easy now. So based upon this results, would you recommend feeding at night versus in the AM to ranchers if you were asked? Honestly, with those younger cows, I would highly recommend that you feed at night because it really does make a statistical difference as I'll go back to my graph to point that out here again. So we can see those that, ca those that were fed in the morning tended to really heavily calb during the night, and those that were fed in the morning, or fed at night, sorry, really tended to calb during the morning. So I think it makes a difference there. Those, those older cows really doesn't tend to make a difference. Any other questions? Well, the one person I couldn't see. <clears throat> My question is in regards to feeding the hay, when did they begin feeding the hay? Was it the third trimester or um, the time period leading up to uh, calving? Very good question, and which I forgot to add in when I was presenting. They started feeding around when that blizzard first hit, so around November 20 of 2022, and then till about May, all of them start respective to their feeding time. So like those morning group, that's seven to nine, AM, PM group, 7 to 9 PM, they all, and the free choice, no, no management practices were changed. They all fed at that same time throughout that season. Any other? Yes, yes Ms. Spielman. Oh, did I take that back? We'll be right to you. Did atmospheric pressure have anything to do with the calving? I believe it does. However, with the limited amount of time that I had to do this study, I was not able to look at that, but that would be something I would like to look into had I would continue this study. Do you think if you didn't include the free choice that would impact your uh, PM to AM birthing rates? Uh, not necessarily, it just depends on when do they cat? When do they eat? When do they not eat? I interpreted that as if you took that treatment away, would it have changed your uh, your ultimate comparison? Ah. <laughs> Personally, I don't really think it would have made a difference. Yes, ma'am. Does what you fed them, do you think that could have affected um, when they gave birth as well? That, another thing, another variable that I would like to look into is to see like if you fed cake or you know a protein supplement like that or if they were min at, had added minerals to see if that made a difference. But with the little min limited amount of time that I had, I just took the hay into this factor with this study. Anything else? Let's thank our speaker. Matt Ozendorf is presenting his senior project looking at the effect of row cleaners on corn seed emergence and yield. Mr. Ozendorf. Thank you, Dr. Pollen. Once again, I was looking at the effect of row cleaners on corn seed emergence and yield. 
So a little bit of background. This year, uh, 94.1 million acres of corn were planted in the United States and 3.9 million acres of corn were planted in North Dakota. Those are for all purposes, including corn silage and grain. And then in Bowman County, where this study was conducted, uh, there's 30,300 acres of corn planted. However, this was only for corn grain, uh, not including silage. So that is where Rain, North Dakota is located, where the study was done is about 15 miles west of Bowman, North Dakota. So what are row cleaners? Um, they're pictured right here. Uh, they're two discs uh, formed in a V-shaped form that go in front of a planter. Uh, why do we need these? Uh, they're used to remove residue with little soil disturbance as possible. Um, residue tends to uh, impact uh, seed to soil contact poorly and cause uneven emergence, according to Ransom. He's an NDSU uh, agronomist. So looking at the effect of row cleaners on corn seed emergence and yield, uh, more so looking on if row cleaners will benefit the emergence with corn and if yield is uh, benefited by that. So there were no studies that were done exactly like this one. However, there were some studies done uh, that were looking at similar variables. Uh, Lekovichin in 2019 uh, looked at row cleaners and how they affected crop residue. Um, he changed, or she changed the disc angles, the spacing, and the speed at which uh, they were ran. Um, this was done at strip tillage, uh, so not during planting season. Um, however, uh, I looked at crop residue differences, so it had some similarities there. And then the other one was done by JASA. This one was done way back in 1982. Um, it was looking at the tillage factors on corn spacing. Uh, they found that the residue impacted uh, uniformity. Uniformity in this instance, meaning how evenly spaced the corn seeds are from each other. Um, and then no-till, they found had the best uniformity uh, compared to uh, other tillage, tillage practices. Um, so this is kind of controversy to what I'm looking at. Uh, you'd th think in uh, no-till there would be a lot of residue, and I said earlier that residue uh, negative, negatively impacts that. However, um, I planted into a no-till situation, so now I want to look at if I remove that residue on top, um, if that's going to benefit the corn seed emergence. And then the last one done by Niemergut uh, was done on planting depth and the effect on corn emergence. He found that it took six to seven days uh, for all the plants to emerge and then uniformity increased with the depth at which they are planted. So in this case, uniformity means uh, how evenly the plants emerge out of the ground. Um, he looked at, he looked at uh, one inch, two inch, and three inches uh, were the different depths that he planted at. Um, he found that at one inch, the, there was not enough soil moisture or consistent soil moisture to have a, a good effect on uh, corn emergence. So methods, I first uh, conducted a residue test. I did this by uh, diagon diagonally measuring uh, 100 inches and each uh, inch mark that uh, crop residue hit, uh, that was tallied, so there's 83 uh, marks that crop residue hit, and then that was put into a percentage of 83%. I then uh, planted two different treatments. Row cleaners is on the top, and no row cleaners is on the bottom. You can see the different amounts of residue disturbance. This is wheat stubble. Um, and then I measured out uh, the study area. Um, it was 17 feet 5 inches, and this is to represent one one-thousandth of an acre. And then three rows were selected to look at, so I did not look at the whole planter width. I only looked at three rows, and they were three, eight, and 13. Uh, they were evenly spaced apart of five rows, uh, kind of to trying to evenly distribute the weight of the planter so that would not affect the emergence. Then I looked at soil moisture and temperature. I did this by probing. Uh, that's the probe I used. I did this every three days around 7 a.m. And then I used, or I probed at two flags uh, right there, and then I also probed in the row. The two flags here almost acted as a control, so that is what's considered out of, out of the row. 
And then obviously in the row is called in the row. You'll see that in my graphs later. I then conduct an emergence test. I did this by scouting the field every day until the first plant had emerged. And once the first plant had emerged, I marked that as day one. And then after that, each day had its own color. So as you can see, uh, day one was signified by a uh, green flag. Day two is blue. Day th three is red. And day four is purple. You can see the different heights uh, between the, each day. And number one is significantly larger than the other ones. And then the last emergence occurred on day 10. Uh, so that's a 10-day span of emergence for all the treatments combined. And then I did a yield estimate. I did this by hand because uh, harvest wasn't, or st we still haven't harvested the corn. So um, I counted the number of ears and I times that by a thousand. Uh, that gets you on a per acre basis for your population. And then I selected five ears in each row. I took those five years of each row, I weighed them all at the same time, and then I av or divided that by five to get my average weight per year. And then I shelled them out, uh, got the moisture percentage, and then I input it into this equation uh, where there's the ear population, the average ear weight, and the percent of moisture. So this graph is looking at the soil moisture um, and looking at the different locations, kind of going back to those flags and the treatments. So this is the percent of soil moisture. Um, as you can see, no row cleaners in the gray. Uh, there was not that big of a difference between the two uh, compared to with row cleaners. Uh, this is probably due to the amount of crop residue that is removed with the row cleaners and the, the amount of the little soil disturbance that is uh, caused with row cleaners. And then this next slide is looking at the rainfall influence on the location of the um, treatments. So on the right here, that is the amount of rainfall that is relative to these bars here. And then on the left is soil moisture again. So this corn was planted on May 15th. You can see there is a decent amount of rain that occurred before planting. And then, so that made the soil moisture higher and at the start. And then we had no rainfall after that for a little while. Um, and then out of the row, in the blue here, drop below in the row. I'm not quite sure why that happened. But then once uh, more rainfall occurred, um, it jumped right back up to about 2% difference. And then looking at the soil temperature, uh, once again, no row cleaners. They're very similar to each other. and then. Uh, no row cleaners uh, had a little bit of difference. Um, however, in the row, it was found that the soil temperature was uh, less than out of the row. I did not expect this. I expected that the row cleaners would increase the soil temperature. But a cause of this, I think, is doing, uh, the time of probing. I did this in the morning, so the outside temperature may have an effect on this. Um, compared to doing it during the day or of various times of the day. So this is looking at the outside temperature and the influence on soil temperature. So as you can see, it was 60 degrees on May 16th. And then on the 19th, it dropped all the way down to 43 degrees. And soil moisture is following the outside temperature fairly consistently. So with emergence, numerically, uh, row cleaners had a greater amount of plants. Uh, that is in the blue here. But statistically, it was not uh, shown to be true, except for on day six, they tended to be true, with 19 plants emerged with row cleaners compared to 17 plants without row cleaners. And then, as you can see here on day five, uh, no row cleaners stopped emerging. And then on day seven, they started emerging again. Uh, so that was a 10-day span of emergence uh, for no row cleaners. But on day seven, uh, with row cleaners, they completed emergence to the total amount of plants that were planted. So that uh, uh, is a result of more uniform emergence with row cleaners compared to without. Then looking at yield, uh, row cleaners, they yielded 
143 bushels an acre compared to 125 bushels an acre. Um, this is an 18 bushel difference. Um, this kind of goes back to the amount of plants that were emerged. So with row cleaners, there was 19,000 plants emerged compared to 17,000, like I said earlier. Um, a study done at Colorado State University, they uh, found that it took about 800 plants per acre to increase 10 bushels an acre in yield. Um, that is a greater increase than what I found here, but that could be due to the location at which the plants were planted. So uh, over, according to the Colorado State one, they would have a better production and plant per plant compared to this one. However, it still stays consistent that more plants uh, increase greater yield. So in conclusion, soil moisture and temperature row cleaners, they show more of a change due to the amount of crop residue that is removed in the row compared to without. And then emergence, uh, more plants emerged with row cleaners, but once again, that was not statistically shown to be proved. Um, and then with yield, row cleaners increased the yield. And then so I would like further research uh, just because I would like to statistically prove that emergence is better with row cleaners uh, compared to without. And then with the yield, the difference between the two is so big that it was kind of surprising actually. I would like to see if doing this multiple times, uh, if that would stay the same or drop uh, to like five or 10 bushels. So, with, and then I would like to thank Dr. Poland for helping with statistics and then Mr. Stroh uh, for helping me with the project overall. Kyle Oakey, he uh, helped me with my emergence test and guided me on how to do that. He's from Agile Agronomy. And then DSU for giving me a grant to complete my undergraduate research. Are there any questions? Questions for our speaker? Since we have no other questions, and I know you're being graded on or scored on your answer to questions, I've at least got to come up with one. What, what's the drawbacks? What, why doesn't everybody use row cleaners? And is it the cost? Is it the inconvenience? Or is it plugging? Or what are the drawbacks? Uh, it's actually kind of opposite. A lot of people use row cleaners, out, but as we usually use row cleaners, uh, but. Uh, there could be more maintenance with them. Um, a lot of planters, they already come with them, um, and it's as simple as raising or lowering them. Um, but I think they benefit just to have an even seed bed for the plant, but that's just my opinion. I uh, hear another senior project is surveying producers to see how many use real quick. So you looked at corn. Do you see this as um, the same results with other types of crops? Uh, yes. So we use a plant or the same planter to plant sunflowers. Um, I did not look at that in the study, but um, we we do see an increase in emergence yield just by eye anyway with sunflowers. Another senior project and an alumni to help guide that. Yeah. Now, did you see a more a consistent, uh, like when you're planting in the rows for, with, with the row cleaners, did you see a more consistent emergence versus like without as many skips or did you versus the ones planting in the, in the dirty rows? Um, yeah, I did see with row cleaners, they were more even um, compared to without. I also, after the, emergence test was done um, like I went out and I dug in between where there was look like skips and some of them uh, like in the no row cleaners there were some seeds there uh, they had germinated but they didn't completely uh, emer emerge so they had uh, died I think we have time for one more question if there are any if not let's thank our speaker
Our last speaker of the afternoon comes to us from someplace Warden. in Montana. Where? Warden. Warden, Montana. Molly Crum is going to talk to us about the rate of change of foreign owned agricultural land in the United States. Ms. Crum. Thank you, Dr. Poland. All right, technical difficulties to get started. All right, so um, more and more Americans are having growing concerns about agricultural land being purchased by foreign entities. Now, even our nation's leaders, legislators both on a state and federal level, are stating that it could be a matter of, eventually be a matter of national security and even food security for our nation. So with that being said, there's currently no federal regulation on foreign ownership of agricultural land in the United States. However, there is a bill recently being pushed through legislation that would place our Secretary of Agriculture on the board for foreign investment. And what that would do would just create a better oversight on this investment being placed into agricultural land by these foreign entities. With that being said, our as far as regulations go, it is strictly on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, a lot of the countries that we're seeing regulations and restrictions being put on are China, Saudi Arabia, um, North Korea, countries where we're seeing a lot of tensions rising in recent years with the U.S. and also, um, for instance, my home state, Montana, just passed legislation this year that would block or restrict foreign entities or Chinese entities from purchasing agricultural land. So for that reason and reasons of uh, the rate of foreign investment going up, I wanted to look in further into this um, because when we're talking about regulation, there isn't a lot of numbers that back it. So for that purpose, I wanted to look not at the overall acreage um, because that's a pretty straightforward number. I wanted to look at the rate of change of this acreage so the objective of this project was to calculate and compare the rate of change of foreign ownership of agricultural land in the United States. And we did this from 2011 to 2021, so that would give us a good base of recent years and how it has changed. And then I wanted to determine, put this, these numbers together to, de to determine who the top 10 players were in terms of increasing at the most rate and at the fastest rate. So foreign investment into agricultural land, this isn't a new topic. In fact, in 1978, when the U.S. was going through a lot of economic turmoil in terms of the agricultural industry, there were a lot of whispers about this um, turmoil being because of foreign investment. And the government took a step back and realized, hey, we don't have a way to approve or disprove these whispers, these claims. So that is when they put into act the Agricultural Foreign Investment Disclosure Act. And I will be re referring to it for the rest of this presentation as a FIDA. So what a FIDA does is it requires all foreign entities, whether they're partnerships, corporations, governments, even individuals or estates, it requires these foreign entities to disclose all of their foreign or their agricultural land holdings in the United States in one uniform record keeping system. So now we have records that date back to 1978 when this was put into place. This ownership that's reportable is defined explicitly by AFIDA. So I'll go through a couple of those definitions with you here quick. First off, we have our reportable ownership and that is gonna include any direct or indirect ownership of land and lease holdings that are greater than or equal to 10 years. Now those indirect players are gonna be people investing in it, might not be hands-on, might be, um, may have never even seen the land. They just put money into it. So they have to report that involvement as little as 10% of their involvement. So if there's a foreign person or a group of people who all have an active part in the group and that group is involved 10% in this land, they have to report that involvement. That's reportable ownership which leads me into holdings, which is just gonna to refer to all of that land that is being foreign held. This involves land transfers, land acquisitions, and holding an interest in, so for instance, investments. Next up, the agricultural land, that's just gonna follow the same USDA definition. It's gonna be anything greater than 10 acres in the aggregate, or less than or equal to 10 acres, but producing more than $1,000 of annual income by agricultural production means. With that being said, this report does divide our land. They must 
disclose whether it is pasture land, cropland, forest land, or other. Um, if the land that they purchase is used for agricultural production in one of any five given years, they must continue reporting that land. So for that purpose, that's where we see a lot of those acres end up in that other group. And moving on, that report or the data that is collected by that <laughs> act is what we use to study this objective. We um, use the FIDA report raw data, which is publicly accessible and very easily accessible, in fact, online. And they're just spreadsheets of raw data. We ended up, we pulled records from 2011 to 2021 and ended up with 112 countries that own land in the United States from this time period. This um, foreign ownership now amounts to 40.8 million acres in the United States, which is 3.1% of all agricultural land. And then in order to calculate our rate of change, we use the slope of our linear growth rate. So to get into a few numbers here, um, what we did to start off uh, with the help of Chip Pollen for our data analysis, um, we just wanted to see who owned the most acres in terms of average over this time period of 2011 to 2021. And as you can see here, our biggest player is Canada in terms of acres held. On average, in this time period, they held a lot of acres over here. The next closest to it, the Netherlands, is just over half the acreage that Canada holds alone. Now these are the top 10 countries in terms of how many acres they held in this time span. This other group involves all 102 countries beyond these. So all of those combined, that acreage still doesn't amount to what Canada holds, which was very surprising for me from what we hear in regulations. Was not expecting that, but um, a disclaimer here, we did leave out two groups of data. The, instead of listing as a country, um, there is a list of people who enter their report or their land under no foreign invested, li no foreign investor listed or no predominant country listed. Now for the purpose of this objective, we wanted to find the top 10 countries. So we left those acres out of this data set. So moving on, Next up, we did correlations. So this is a lot to look at in a lot of names. And you may be picking and choosing which ones you're gonna look at, but um, these are the significantly correlated countries. So in terms of your acres held and increasing years, you can see that there were a significant amount of countries who were positively correlated, meaning they were gaining acres <laughs> at a significant rate. Um, not correlated, they aren't gaining or losing acres really, they're just kind of staying steady. And then our negatively <coughs> correlated, as you can see there's very few countries there, those are the ones that are acquiring less acres per year. A couple of names to kind of keep in mind, Denmark and the Netherlands were in the top 10 for acres held, however in this set it shows that they aren't gaining nor losing, they're kind of just in that steady, steady spot. Um, as you can see China is on here. They are gaining in acres, and that's where we see a lot of regulations being placed. Um, Canada, again, obviously they're on here, a big player. So as we move forward, this is a visual of all the country's uh, slopes from 2011 to 2021. So these are the ones increasing at the most, in terms of the most acres per year. So when I first saw this and came into this project, I had an idea based on what is being talked about in media and also regulations being placed, who I thought those top players are. So this is purposely left unlabeled to kind of give you guys a little speculation of your own. The ones above the line zero, obviously, as I had talked in the correlations, there are a lot of countries that are gaining land in acres. And there are very few, as shown below this axis, that are losing acreage. With that being said, here are your top 10 countries in terms of gaining acres on average per year between 2011 and 2021. So as you can tell, Canada, again, our big player, in terms of gaining acreage, they gained about 500 and almost 600,000 acres per year on average. The next closest to them aren't even reaching a third, and that would be Italy at 100 and just about 180,000 per year. 
these countries are the ones that held the most in terms of average acres um, overall. So as was portrayed in that pie chart, this could mean that we might want to keep an eye on these countries because not only do they own a lot of acres, but they're also adding a large amount of acres per year. They're in the top 10 for both groups. As you can see, China is also on this chart, and I hate to kind of burst the bubble, that's going to be the last time that we see them in this data set. So they are in the top 10 for in terms of adding acres per year. So what happened after we calculated this is I wanted to, I decided that wasn't enough for rate of change. I also wanted to look at the percent change of um, how these countries are changing in regards to what they already hold in acres. So we took their average acres held and combined it with the data for the absolute rate of change of it by acres. And this is when we got the percent change um, based upon what acres they already held. So as you can see, there are many more new names that weren't on the last two groups. Uh, Cambodia, Cuba, the UAE, the three that should look familiar to you are Luxembourg, Sweden, and the Cayman Islands. I know it's kind of hard to see there with the timestamp below. But these countries were also in that last group in terms of increasing by acres per year on average. So what that means is that not only are they adding in the top 10 for adding acres per year, but they're also in the top 10 by percent that they're increasing. So if this remains consistent, then um, as far as percentage, then they're going to continually be adding more and more acres per year to their ownership. With that being said, Israel is the only one out of these entire groups that aren't um, significantly correlated, meaning it is not increasing definitively per year. So to kind of wrap it up here, as far as results go, if we're going to place regulations based on whether or not uh, where we want to slow the increase of foreign investment into our land and slow the acres being held, I would like to, I would think arguably these nine countries would be ones to look at. Now all these countries are friendly with the US and so kind of dis or approved what I was thinking that a lot of the regulations that we're placing now as far as state by state are based upon national and food security as a lot of legislators have stated. Um, for example, these six countries, as I had said before, not only do they hold the most acres, but they're adding the most acres per year. And it's a lot of acres. So these three down here, the Cayman Islands, Sweden, and Luxembourg, they have the potential to not only, if their percent increase stays the same, not only move up within that average acre increase group, but they could end up placing themselves on the average acres held if that remains consistent and they continue to add more and more acres per year. So in conclusion, um, as I had said, in terms of regulation, if the goal is to limit uh, this land going to foreign entities, maybe we need to start looking at some of these nine countries. Um, when you use these numbers in comparison, in conjunction with each other, then we start to see um, start to see a little bit of a bigger picture of what's happening in terms of land ownership. However, this isn't to say the countries such as Saudi Arabia and China aren't an issue, because obviously tensions are rising, especially in recent years, and what they're using that land for is not disclosed in this report. So it's just saying that if it were to slow the rate of increase of foreign-owned agricultural land in the U.S., then we might need to start looking at these other nine countries. So overall, fact of the matter is, big picture, is that foreign ownership is increasing. Um, we started out at 1% in 1978 when they started this act. Now we're at 3.1%, and that may not seem significant, but over the last couple of years alone, we, start, we were at 2.9% in 2019 of all agricultural land held in the U.S., and now we're at 3.1%. So just in those couple of years, um, as far as 2021 goes, we increased at a rapid rate in that short amount of time. So. Just something to kind of keep your eye on. I think awareness that this data is available and accessible to you is important for us to know as Americans, as agricultural producers, because decisions being made on this are going to affect our livelihood eventually, and we don't want to wake up one day and say, hey, 10% of our land is foreign held, and at this point, there's not much we can do about it. That's one in every 10 acres. So I think 
being aware of this information as a whole and digging into it, it is a whole rabbit hole. There's a lot of good information on it. So I definitely recommend you taking a look at it to it yourself. It's available on the USDA website. And with that being said, I would like to give a couple of thank yous out. So I would like to thank Dr. Poland for all of his help in the data analysis and helping me to understand what that means. Um, like I said, there's a lot of rabbit holes you can go down in this data and I probably will continue looking into it as we go out throughout the years just to see how it's changing. And then I would also like to thank Mr. Toby Stroh for all of his help with the paper and keeping me online in track. And then obviously my family for all their support while I've been here out in Dickinson, North Dakota. So with that being said, are there any questions? Questions for our last speaker? Well, yeah. I didn't even have to pull that one. <laughs> right there. Is there any way to track, say, Canada is showing that they are holding a lot of American land. Is there any way to track the ownership of the companies or entities that actually own from Canada and where their roots are from. We had a situation where, and th this is where the question is coming from, mm -hmm. where um, somebody I know was selling to a, a fairly large corporation and it showed that they were out of Australia. When they tracked them to Australia, they found out that their mother company actually was out of China. Is there any way to do that? See, and I think that's one of the pitfalls with this report that hopefully is fixed if their Secretary of Agriculture does get put on that board for foreign investment. The FIDA report, um, well, it does collect that information and these corporation or companies' names, these big corporations. There are still those two groups, as I had said, where they don't list, it says no foreign investor listed, and I cannot find a definition for that term, and, which is interesting because they did have a definition for the no predominant country listed, and that could be if there's multiple countries acting in concert or one individual doesn't have a certain place of origin or they have dual citizenship, then they don't have to disclose which countries they are from in that. It's just no predominant country listed, and that may have been the case for that. Otherwise, in this report, if you do want to go through it, they do list the corporations and where they're from firsthand, but that's not to say that in this case, maybe it was one of those no predominant countries listed because they had two headquartered. I'm not sure on that. That's just opinion, but um, there, there is potential that that might have been the possibility there. Good question. Anything else? Yeah, thank you. Seeing none, she must have managed her time and content well. Very good. Let's thank it. our last speaker. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming. This is an annual event, uh, usually the uh, Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So granted, most of you are here to see family. But if you'd like to come back and see other graduates in the future, you're more than welcome. Um, I think without further ado, unless Toby or Jerry give me a signal, we are Adjourned. We're adjourned. Very good.